So I want you to understand that the topic is very specific for a reason. And I'm not intentionally offending you, but I do hope, inshallah ta'ala, that every single one of you finds something in this lecture tonight where you say to yourself, maybe that's where I fall and that's where I need to work. Maybe that's where I fall and that's where I need to work. Why? Because we all have deficiencies. And if any of you actually read the title of the talk before you signed up, how to become a more wholesome Muslim, there is meaning to that. What I could do is I could talk to you about the things that I'm pretty certain as an audience, as maybe a, a masjid going audience or an audience that typically goes to masajid and engages in Islamic activities and is familiar with Islamic education online. I could share with you the things that I know that most of you probably already do and encourage you to do more of it and talk about the rewards of those things. But actually what I want you to do and what I find is the most useful exercise at the beginning of any talk is for you to actually do your own introspection and ask yourself, if I was giving advice to myself, if myself just walked through the door and I was another person and I had to give myself advice as a friend or give a lecture or talk to someone on a heart-to-heart -heart basis and say something that might be an uncomfortable truth. What would I say to myself if I knew myself as a friend for let's say five months and I've spent every day with you for five months, then I probably have a pretty good idea of who you are. Now, you've spent every single moment with yourself since you've been here, but I'm talking about if your self was a friend. Five months, six months, I've seen you every day, and now I need to have a really uncomfortable conversation with you. What would I have to say to you? And what would be the nasiha, the advice that you need to hear? And subhanAllah, you'll find that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned that tafakkur, tadabur and tafakkur, that contemplation, introspection, is like holding up a mirror to yourself. And it is the clearest, most clarifying mirror that you can possibly have. You see, if you have a righteous friend that is willing to share with you certain things that you might need to hear at times because they love you more than they love your friendship. Those are special people, by the way. If you come across one of them, alhamdulillah. They love you more than they love your friendship. Meaning what? I'd rather tell you something that I think you need to hear, even if that means that I might alienate you from me because I think it'll make you a better person. Very few friends are like that. And when you find a friend like that, make sure that when they give you nasiha, when they give you that sincere advice, you thank them in a way that they will want to give it to you again and that they'll be willing to receive it as well. If you have people like that, those are the people that Allah is talking about when He says, tawasal bil haqqi wa tawasal bil sabr. They enjoin one another in truth and they keep each other patient. Those types of friends, right? That will actually take the time and care to love you more than they even love your friendship. Now, yourself is even more clarifying, especially if you're paying close attention to yourself. And you should care about your hereafter more than anyone else cares for your hereafter. You see, there's a handoff point, especially for many Muslims that grow up in Muslim households, where your parents care more for your Islam than you care for your own Islam. And then there comes a point where you've got to take control of your own narrative and your own religion and your own story. And this has to become now your pursuit. It's no longer them waking you up for prayer. It's yourself waking up for prayer before they can even come knock on the door. It's no longer them reminding you. It's you reminding yourself because you realize at some point you love your success in the Akhirah more than they love your success in the Akhirah. I'll give you an example from a worldly perspective. You know, there's a point in life where a person who's pursuing a certain level of education has to have buy-in in their own education. Your parents can put you in the best schools. Think about the worldly perspective. They can get you the best teachers, the best education. They can invest in your after-school education. They can help get you enrolled in the best universities. But at some point, it's going to be you sitting in that chair in the classroom. And if you don't choose to learn and succeed, you're just going to fail even in the best university. There's a spiritual analogy there too. That even if someone gets you the best environment, 
the best teachers, puts you in the best community, puts you in the best university, the university of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is the university you want to be enrolled in, his sunnah, at some point, you've got to be wanting to succeed and learn and grow, or else you fall off. Now that's just one example of this. So as I said, if I don't make you a little bit uncomfortable in this lecture, then I failed as a lecturer. And if I don't heed my own advice and make myself a little bit uncomfortable, then I failed as a Muslim, to be honest with you. So let's talk about the subject for a bit, inshallah ta'ala. The idea of being a more wholesome Muslim. Now, the first way I want you to look at this is I want you to take a step back and I want you to think about some amazing people we have in history and some of the qualities that made them amazing. And whether those qualities match the typical circumstances of those people. So I'll start with the Prophet of Allah. Who are the wealthy prophets you think of? Who are the wealthy prophets? Like the prophets that were rich, the prophets that were wealthy, the prophets that were powerful. Sulaiman alayhi salam. Who was his father? Dawood alayhi salam. The prophet Dawood alayhi salam. So one of the beautiful things that you see with Dawood and Sulaiman is that Sulaiman alayhi salam is a prophet of Allah. Therefore, he's naturally nourished in righteousness and made worthy of being a recipient of revelation. But it's beautiful when you see succession in the Qur'an between parents and children. The most common ones we talk about are Ibrahim السلام, and his children. And then that to Yaqub السلام, to Jacob, and then to Yusuf السلام, to Joseph. And there's such a consistency there. And you can see the same elements of righteousness and beauty transitioning from one parent to the next, which is beautiful, right? You don't just see that they all are Muslims, but if you met Ishaq alayhi salam or you met Ismail alayhi salam and you had known their father Ibrahim alayhi salam, you would see it. You'd catch it. There is Ibrahim alayhi salam. You remind me of your father. It's a good parent. You know, if you met Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, if you met Fatima, you would see everything of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam if you knew the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it used to stun people to the point that they'd say, subhanAllah, even her walk was exactly like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I've never seen a person who resembled the Prophet ﷺ more. Hadiyan wa samta. In mannerism, in appearance, in every single detail, like Fatima to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam taslim al kathira. So there's a transition. Like if I met Ismail and Ishaq and I knew Ibrahim, may Allah allow us to one day know them all in person in paradise. Allahumma ameen. I'd say, I see your father in you. I can see your mother in you. I see the transition point. I see the characteristics. So if you met Sulaiman alayhi salam and you had known Dawood alayhi salam, there's a clear transition here. There's a beauty in the similarities of their character. Now Dawood alayhi salam, as I said, I want you to kind of take a step back and think about a wholesome person. Dawood alayhi salam, from a worldly perspective, is marked by his wealth and his power, right? He's a powerful prophet. He's a wealthy prophet. He's successful in the dunya we sense as he is in the dini sense and all of the prophets are successful, right? But if you saw his worldly achievements, there's success there, right? And usually with that type of success, which his son inherited and then had grown in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed in response to his dua, customized an even bigger kingdom, usually people that have that type of success have certain flaws that become more pronounced, even sometimes to their own ignorance. You know, if you were to take yourself, and, and some people have witnessed a great variety of change in their lives in terms of their economic circumstances. I know many of you are young and you haven't gone through that, right? But at one point, very hardworking, poor. At some point, still hardworking, but maybe they succeed in a worldly sense. Uh, maybe some people came from a country where certain expectations of service and uh, respect were not necessarily there, but now they're in a different type of society. And so that expectation and that service is there. 
It's like, you know, I, I'll, I'll never forget, and may Allah forgive this brother, and I gave a khutbah today about not mocking people, but it hurt me to hear it, honestly. I remember in Hajj, very specific moment in my life, and the American Hajjaj, Nasrullah al-Afiyah, may Allah protect us all and accept our Hajj. But we go there with expectations like, hey, I paid for the package, right? And this guy, you know, a bus is late, and he goes to the guy who's running the buses, and he asks him when the buses are, and the guy kind of brushes him off. And in the thickest accent that was not an American accent, says, I'm an American. Like, MashaAllah, get back in line. Right? But there was something that that came from, like in a change of circumstance meant a change of how I expect the world to approach me now. Right? Like when you get wealthier, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all goodness in this life and in the next, whether that's manifested in wealth or not. But when you live a life of more ease, you expect better service at the restaurant. You're more easily irritated because your circumstances dictate there, this idea that I've paid my way up to expecting a certain level of treatment at this point in my life. Maybe I wouldn't have had that same level of expectation earlier on. And I don't recognize that as arrogance in myself, but in reality, what changed? What changed, right? So with Dawood Islam, powerful, wealthy, successful, yet look at what he's praised for in the Quran and the Sunnah. And take a step back. He's praised for his worship. He's praised for his ibadah, which is very significant here because Adam alayhi salam, when his descendants were being extracted from his loins, he saw this light in the creation. And he said, who is that child of mine? And he was told it's Dawood alayhi salam. And Dawood was so beautiful that Adam alayhi salam gave him several decades of his life said this man needs to live more on earth what did the prophet sallallahu praise about dawood can anyone tell me anything you remember about dawood and his ibadah his worship any hadith you may have heard you can raise your hands i don't want to hear the mumbling so anything you've heard about dawood yeah a wise person is hikmah is praised qiyamul layl sheikh atif you can't answer me you're a sheikh <laughs> he was generous. The Sheikh just gave you an answer. What did he say? He was a king. All right. Why is no one repeating the answer of the Sheikh? I'm t- he was right. Qiyam al MashaAllah. What's your name? Iman. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is it? Yaman. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and increase you. Qiyam uh, al The Prophet mentioned the best prayer at night, Qiyam al-Layl, is the prayer of Dawood You know that last third of the night? He traced that to Dawood that Dawood used to wake up in the last third of the night. Meaning Dawood was not satisfied with simply being wealthy and being a prophet and someone who gives a lot. He also was pushing himself to pray at night. What else? There's another very distinct ibadah, act of worship that he was famous for. Yeah. Dua, Sliyam. What is, what is his fasting? Someone raised their hand. What was his fasting? This can mean many things. Day on and day off. Jazakallah khair. Allah hafadak. May Allah preserve you. Day on and day off. The Prophet ﷺ said the best fasting is the fasting of Dawood. ﷺ. He would fast today and break his fast the next day. How amazing is that? His habit was to fast every other day. Alayhi salam. My beloved brothers and sisters, be the best version of yourself have the best character and conduct have the best attitude have the best personality and become the best in your own field islam doesn't support this mediocre and like lowly all this lifestyle or skill islam respects and honors the high skilled people the people with Izzah, the people with high spirit, the people who have the high inspiration and motivation to do something. Islam loves the skillful people. Learn new skills every now and then. Become a skilled human being rather than knowing nothing, being lethargic and lazy and one of the lowly person. Become a better person. 
a strong human being is more loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a weak Muslim who doesn't do anything. Because this strong Muslim, he can serve the ummah with his money, with his skill, with his hard work, with everything. So become the strong Muslim, strong ummah. Become the strong doctor, a scientist, uh, you know, a programmer or software engineer or a great businessman. Become someone great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the big personality. Allah loves the rich Muslim who will serve the ummah, who will build masajids, who will help the foundations and organizations who will build Islamic institutions. So be a person of authority. And together with that, don't be an arrogant human being. Don't be a person full of pride. Allah doesn't love the arrogant people. Inna Allah la yuhibbul mutakabbirin. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love those who are arrogant. Allah loves the humble people. Allah loves those who are nice to people. And Allah said to talk nicely with people. And wherever you need to talk, talk. Otherwise, keep silent. That is wisdom. Become wise human being. May Allah give us the understanding of this deen. May Allah make us the person of good character and conduct. And may Allah make us skillful human being. And may Allah grant us Jannatul Firdaus Al-A'la. Help us build an Islamic studio at www.islamicstudio.org. Link in the description.